join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hi, my name is Krishnan. Today I'll be doing the Hindi news analysis. So these are the five articles that we'll be seeing today and we'll be seeing few previous year questions also. Let us go to the first article. This article is a very interesting article because uh, the author here talks about uh, how Chinese claims on Arunachal Pradesh is bogus and uh, India has uh, historical and civilizational connect with Arunachal Pradesh. Let's go into the article. So why is this in news? Because uh, we all know China has renamed 11 places in Arunachal Pradesh like few mountains, rivers, everything they have uh, renamed it. So, so what is Zangnan? So this is what uh, China calls uh, Arunachal Pradesh. They call it Zangnan. So keep this in mind. So this is not the first time they are doing it. They have done it back in 2017 and 2021. So where are these 11 places located in? Uh, they are located in Pangcheng, Tawang, Chang, Sela Axis, so which is which run runs down across line of actual control and taxing in Upper Subhan Sri district, Menchuka, Tato, Tessel, and West Siang, and Lohit and Anjav district near Balong. So, the 11 places are near these places. So, so next point, what you're telling China does the same thing in South China Sea, too. So, we all know, right. Uh, this is not just uh, limited to India, this conflict, they are doing it everywhere. So in South China Sea also they are uh, doing it. For 80 geographical features, they have given name, names in Parasol and Spratly Island in the South China Sea. So also keep this word in mind, Diao Tai. So Senkaku Islands is called Diao Tai by China. So where is the Senkaku Islands? It's in East China Sea. So here the dispute is with Japan. So keep this in mind, they might ask, uh, what does the Diao Tai mean in, in films, they might ask this. So what is its real name? It's called the Senkaku Islands. It is in the East China Sea. So the ch dispute is with China, I mean China and Japan. So what is the modus operandi, modus operandi of China? How do they wage wars? So this is called the three warfare strategy. First there is propaganda. Next, there is uh, psychological warfare and then there is legal warfare. So this is how China is operating. So and they are doing a lot of other silly stuff. So undersea features, they have named it using Chinese musical instruments. And uh, recently they had uh, Coast Guard law that came into effect in February 1, 2021. So this has led to a conflict with India because uh, India sees this as a sovereign issue. So what happened in 2017, China started construction of dual purpose village in Arunachal Pradesh. So these dual purpose villages are called Siakong villages. So where was this uh, villages constructed? It was con constructed in area adjacent to border area from Ladakh to Arunachal. So an entire stretch. So this was constructed in the entire stretch from Ladakh to Arunachal. So China's bogus claim. So why we are telling China's bogus claim? Because China is telling uh, historically Tibet has been, uh, Tibet and uh, Arunachal has been a part of uh, his uh, China, but uh, we'll see here, it is not true. So, King, King Dynasty in Tibet, only after 1720, so only in the 18th century, Chinese presence was felt in Tibet and Arunachal Pradesh. So, how did they come there? Chinese interference, that is this King Dynasty interfered after the death of 6th Dalai Lama. So, Arunachal Pradesh was earlier known as Northeast Frontier Agency. Uh, home to various tribes that are part of India's civil civilizational heritage. So what we'll see here is we'll see historically Arunachal Pradesh was oriented towards the Assam Plains, not towards the east. It was oriented towards the west, towards Assam Plains. So they were in contact with homes, uh, homes and uh, they were even granted rights to levy tax. So what is the tax called? Posha. So Monpas were Buddhist. And other tribes in Arunachal Pradesh uh, follow animistic religion, that is they worship uh, spirits. Some tribes follow Vaishnavism. So see, historically they are uh, civilizational connect also is there with Hindus only and India only. Arunachal tribes that live here have been mentioned in Mahabharata, Ramayana, Kalika Purana, Vishnu Purana, Yogini Purana and even in Kalidasas, Kalidasas, Raghuvamsa, even in Raghuvamsa, 
Arunachal Pradesh is mentioned. So this shows that uh, Arunachal Pradesh and its people have always been the been a part of collective consciousness of Indian people, and it has all always been a part of cultural moorings of India also. So even if you talk about uh, kingdoms in ancient India like uh, Pragyotisha, Kamarupa, they all had Arunachal within its boundaries. So if you go to Zero Valley, you'll see. uh shivalinga there is parashuram kund you can even see the temple ruins of uh, malinitan so and all these things are connected to the le- legends of parashuram rukmini bhishma ka shishupala so this shows ancient influence in this region what influence hindu influence so mishmis so few mishmis consider themselves to be the descendants of bhishma ka so some tribes some akas claim the descent from king baluka so what happened sometime back there was a, there were few silver coins were found which had arabic script in it so this belonged to a muslim ruler of bengal so all these things are there this shows very close connect with india so the architecture of many forts such as uh, balugpang itta and bishmak nagar so all the the, the architecture of the fort is influenced by the ar- architectural principles of fort construction found in ramayana mahabharata and arthashastra so whatever fort construction that ramayana mahabharata and arthashastra is telling the same fort construction only we can find in balukpong itta and bishmak nagar so finally what we are telling the state represents the finest of india's cultural and civilizational heritage so whatever is uh, is india's cultural and civilized civilizational heritage in mainland india the same thing is for arunachal pradesh there is no change so india needs to so finally what they are telling if china Uh, changes the name of place illegally uh, always we are refuting it the other is telling what we can do we can also rename places is telling akshay chin is a chinese name we can change it to akshaya chinha everlasting symbol so is telling change akshay chin name like this this will be a good start if you do this chinese will stop doing all their silly things like that uh, this article is arguing now let us move on to the next article this article is about uh, the increasing heat in urban areas so it is already summer right and we are feeling the heat so the author here talks about uh, why are we doing so the author here talks about why it is increasing and uh, what can we do about it so he gives a data initially so 350 million indians were exposed to strong heat st- heat stress between April and May 2022. So 350 million Indians. So just think about it. Uh, so they are constantly exposed to heat stress. So between 1990 and 2019, summer temperatures on an average rose by 0.5 degree to 0.9 degree Celsius across many districts in Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Rajasthan. So specifically, it it was a sharp rise in urban temperatures. So urban heat island effect. it is there in all indian cities so what do we call a urban heat island so temperature will be 4 to 12 degrees celsius higher than the rural outlying areas so the suburbans and the extended areas from chennai will be relatively cool but the central part of the city alone will be like 4 to 12 12 degrees celsius higher and uh, what is uh, another great area of concern is even if the temperature is very high the humidity is much more higher than that so this is also an area of concern and in north india you have weather variability so what is weather variability cold weather in january heat wave in february and march and suddenly now you have hail storms so you see this is weather variability something is happening in jan and in february the exact opposite of it is happening this is weather variability so this is also is an increasing phenomena in india so what will it happen it it has a lot of consequences but the consequences are especially very bad for agriculture so 90% of india's cumin production comes from gujarat and rajasthan and uh, what we have seen is weather variability in rajasthan has destroyed this cumin production so now it has destroyed cumin production but in the future what it will do it will lead to drought and higher mortality so all this rising heat and all no it has made cities unlivable so a lot of people uh, think about leaving their cities during summer or uh, go and settle in a rural area or a tier 2 tier 3 city so because of this heat what is uh, happening 
there are a lot of laborers doing heavy work in India. So because of this heat, they lost 162 work hours per year. So what do we know from this? If temperatures keep rising, it directly imp impacts labor productivity. And uh, see, 50% uh, of India's workforce is export exposed to heat during the working hours. So who are these people? Uh, marginal farmers, laborers at construction sites, uh, street vendors, and even gig economic workers uh, uh, because they use uh, the road, they use their vehicles to move on the road. Even they are affected because of this heat. So these are the problems. How to reduce this? How to mitigate? First, Tatar is telling greening is the solution. So plant trees, this is the only solution. So for every citizen, every urban citizen, we need at least seven trees. So, and uh, for uh, tier 1, tier 2, next set of cities, what you do? Increase the density of urban forest. So, if you start having urban forest, the heat will not be that high. So, for that, he is giving few solutions. What are they? We can expand wetlands, restore dead lakes and ponds. So, what it will do? It will not only reduce heat, it will increase the ecological functioning in the uh, ecosystem as well. So... Next, what they are telling, uh, you use permeable materials in civic infrastructure. So, and increase natural laps, landscape in urban areas. So, if you use brick jollies for ventilation uh, and even terracotta tiles, <laughs> it will allow hot air to escape. So, because of ventilation problem only, air is inside the room itself. So, if, if you have brick jollies or terracotta tiles, this will allow hot air to escape. So, and may finally what you should do anthropogenic emissions from vehicles so you should uh, think of cutting them also so and next what is telling so is telling avoid usage of heat absorbent galvanized iron and metal roof sheets metal roof sheets so is telling don't use these things while you are building house and uh, even use cleaner cooking fuels so if people don't use lpg what they do they use cow dung uh, they use uh, uh, tree box, so on and so forth. So, it's telling don't use all those things. If you use cooking fuels, it will reduce indoor air pollution. And uh, if streets face ventilation problem, they can be expanded or uh, increase their natural veg vegetation, have parks, and so on. So, let's see how Chandigarh was uh, uh, planned when it came into. Uh, existence so design of Chandigarh is climate responsive see uh, it is lucky because it was set up at the foothills of Shiva Lake between two river beds so eventually uh, when the initial itself when the city was planned uh, green belt was a part of it so they even had mango trees so these mango trees were planted to separate residential area and industrial hub so what are the other things that they did they had mud houses because it is uh, climate responsive and Sukna Lake was created to cool the city. So parks were planned, tree plantation, all these things are done. So in the future, what else can we do? We can have uh, public transport transportation. So everybody should use public transport only. That stage should come. And uh, we should reduce personal vehicle usage. And uh, uh, landfills, they are also a problem. Because uh, if you have landfills, uh, there will be methane production. And methane production will lead to fire. So, all these things will only increase the urban heat and weather variability. So, if you don't want to have landfills, what are you supposed to do? Here it is not uh, water segregation, waste segregation. So, if you segregate uh, waste at source, source itself, you don't need to have landfills. Like we can recycle, recycle the waste. Next, what is telling? Here is talking about technology. So, you improve the forecasting ability. Uh, analyze the impact on food security. So, because most of these changes are affecting food security only, so you, you develop forecasting technology so that in, few, in advanced level of time itself, we can analyze that there is going to be some problem for food security. So, he's telling develop these uh, predictive models. So, next, uh, uh, what he's talking about is telling food inflation also is based on monsoon. So, now that heat trends are also there, he's telling uh, when you calculate MSP, you need to have local heat trends also in uh, determining food price because uh, heat impacts production storage and sale right if the heat is high you should take that also into consideration because high heat will uh, lead to reduced 
production and storage you cannot store it for a long time it will go decay so all those things are there so is telling uh, heat management what you are supposed to do you you go from state level district level city municipality all this uh, small small from small small areas you start and you have it till state so next is telling el nino is going to be there el nino el nino induced monsoon is bad for farmers so is telling the parliamentary is telling the policy policy makers should uh, be ready to take uh, mitigatory approach so is telling rather than doing some random ad hoc uh, measures is telling to have structural infrastructural measures to so that we are able to adapt to, to these conditions so every time not just uh, give knee jerk reaction we should have uh, structural infrastructure so that whenever there is problem we can immediately react to it so this is what uh, this article is about let us now move on to the next article this article talks about uh, the various uh, industries that are present in different districts and what is their contribution to exports in india so this is they might ask us uh, upsc might ask us a prelims question asking which district specializes in what uh, and so on and so forth so this is a very important article uh, which is the top export uh, exporting district in india it is jamnagar so keep this in mind this could uh, actually be a prelims question so 24% of india's exports uh, came from jamnagar in 2023 so one fourth of uh, india's exports is just coming from one district which is jamnagar so next we have surat in gujarat and then mumbai is urban in maharashtra so but even if they come second and third they contribute only 5.4.5% of the total country's exports so this is actually a very small amount only so what are the other districts in top 10 we have dakshina kannada in karnataka dwaraka baruk and kutch in gujarat mumbai kanchipuram and gautam buddh nagar so so these are the 10 districts in top 10 uh, that are uh, top exporting districts for india so just uh, keep all these places in mind so in the map one uh, here's the map one so here we'll see uh, districts that form the highest share share of a state's export so in for tamil nadu it is uh, kanchipuram which formed the 33% so this is the highest for uh, all districts in tamil nadu then for madhya pradesh we have indore and uh, jaipur for rajasthan so they formed uh, 21% of the state's total exports so but if you take northeast they form 90% of the state's export like one district itself is forming 90% of the state's export so that is uh, gomati of tripura riboy of meghalaya and east sikkim of uh, sikkim 90% of state's export is coming from just these uh, districts and even for uh, kerala ernakulam fo- formed f- about 40 to 50% of their respective states exports so uh, why is uh, why is jamnagar having a lion share in export because uh, they specialize in petroleum export and uh, kanchipuram specializes in smartphones and uh, you all know kamroop is in assam they export tea and gautam buddh nagar in uttar pradesh also exports smartphones uh, raipur in chatisgarh exports parboiled rice and mumbai suburban in maharashtra exported diamond so all these questions uh, they might ask so they might ask uh, raipur in chatisgarh exports what kamrup in assam exports what so the, all these questions they might ask so so in, in now let us see what are the top 5 districts exporting petroleum so obviously first is jamnagar then we have dakshina kannada and third place we have begusarai and uh, top five exporting districts uh, exporting uh, precious stones and jewelry first we have surat then mumbai mumbai suburban jaipur kolkata then top five districts exporting rice wheat and other cereals karnal raipur and east godavari top 5 uh, districts exporting uh, smartphones and electronic parts first we have gautam buddh nagar then kanchipuram kolar bengaluru rural and kutch and then we have top 5 exporting districts top 5 districts exp- exporting vehicles other than railways first we have kanchipuram then pune gurugram anandpur and aurangabad and finally we'll see top 5 districts exporting pharmaceutical products first we have uh, metal 
மல்கஜ்கிரி அகமதாபாத் ரங்கரெடி சோலானன் விசாகப்பட்டம் ஸோ திஸ் ஆர்டிக்கல் இஸ் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் பிகாஸ் தே மை டாஸ் திஸ் இன் த பிலிம் ஸ்டெல்லிங் விச் டிஸ்ட்ரிக்ட் ஸ்பெஷலைசஸ் இன் எக்ஸ்போர்ட்டிங் வேர்ட் ஸோ பை ஹவுட் ஆல் திஸ் பிளேசஸ் நவ் லெட் அஸ் மூவ் டு த நெக்ஸ்ட் டாபிக் திஸ் டாபிக் இஸ் அபவுட் பிளாஸ்டிக் டெப்ரி இன் த ஓஷன் அண்ட் வாட் ஆர் த ஹவ் ஆர் த ஸ்பீஷிஸ் ரியாக்டிங் தேர் வாட் இஸ் ஹப்னிங் வித் சி இன் திஸ் ஆர்டிக்கல் ஸோ ஃபர்ஸ்ட் யூ ஷுட் நோ வாட் இஸ் ஆந்த்ரோபோசின் ஏபோக் so the article says scholars are debating about anthropocene epoch so what is anthropocene epoch uh, in the exam they might ask you this so uh, no with so anthropocene epoch is when one species dominates the planet's geology ecosystem and even its fate so uh, what is that species that is homo sapiens so when homo sapiens are dominating the planet's geology ecosystem and fate it is called anthropocene epoch so some say this started with the first nuclear weapon test some say this started with the industrialization after the second world war so but some are saying this started only with the creation of plastic trash so well, this is debatable so next we'll see what is the great pacific garbage patch so water currents in oceans how 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 are they formed they are either driven by winds and coriolis force uh, both together this garbage patch is formed so they are called gyres so this they might ask as a geography question uh, so the best example for this is the north pacific subtropical gyre so see here uh, so where is this located this is located in the north of equator in the pacific ocean so it consists of the kuroshio current north pacific california current north pacific current california current and the north equatorial current so this moves in a clockwise direction and uh this has uh, 51 countries as a part of this gyre so you have to see all this place all these countries so totally it has 51 countries as a part of it so north of uh, hawaii is the long east to west to east to the west strip so the debris the pl- plastic debris is collected over a period of 50 years and uh, uh the this in the east west strip the east part is the greatest that is the great pacific garbage patch it is 1.6 million square kilometers big so here is only the great uh, pacific garbage patch so how many tons of uh, plastic is here 45000 to 129000 metric tons of plastic and they are all microplastics so and the density of uh, plastics is also uh, is uh, is quite huge it is around 4 particles per cubic meter and particles and plastics that haven't broken down or 92 percentage so so what scientists did they studied this gyres and they studied the debris also they found that 98% of the debris item had invertebrate organisms and within that inver- invertebrate organism what they found pelagic species that is species that are found in the open ocean are 94 percentage and coastal species are 70.5 percent so why is this shocking because coastal species are supposed to be in coastal areas only you know why are they in uh, why are they in open ocean so they found out that uh, coastal species have uh, somehow come to the open areas through plastic so coastal species such as, such as anthropods mollusks uh, what happened the, they rafted on plastic and uh, they are three times greater uh, in the open ocean than the pelagic species so and uh, among both the coastal and pelagic organis- organism crustaceans what is crustaceans like uh, crab they were the most common so and the coastal coastal species are mostly found on fishing nets whereas pelagic species on crates so all these organisms all these things came from northwest pacific origin including japan so here we had 68% of the coastal taxa and 33% of the pelagic taxa they reproduced asexually so uh, and sexual reproduction is also is there among the hydroids and the crustaceans so how they because the plastic the heat the ocean gyres all this uh, determine their mobility and how they reproduce they reproduce sexually or asexually that also they uh, determine so what do all this mean that that is uh, coastal community species in open sea areas so scientists are calling this the neopelagic community that is coastal community species in open area seas they are called neopelagic 
so what do they do they live and reproduce in plastic items itself so the same thing was observed in rocks in china anthropokinos of uh, brazil and plastic glomerates of hawaii so in all these areas we have seen the same thing so anthropocene working group of international commission on stratigraphy what they'll do they'll uh, vote and decide whether uh, anthropocene epoch had started or not because uh, the plastic we have all the report uh, regarding the plastics so they'll vote and tell whether the anthropocene epoch had started or not let us move to the next article this is an important article because uh, india is telling russia that uh, there's a huge uh, trade imbalance in favor of russia and russia needs to do something about it so why is this in news because uh, trade balance between india and russia so russian deputy prime minister uh, has come he said uh, russia will buy manufacturing equipment including uh, heavy machineries from india so why are they where are they talking all this they are talking all this in the intergovernmental commission between russia and india so what else did they uh, talk there they talked about uh, defense cooperation and uh, issues uh, related to deliveries and payments so the payments are getting delayed due to the war in ukraine so that is why it was discussed and uh, uh, they also discussed uh, india's plan for russian far eastern region so why far eastern region of russia is important because you get uh, oil gas and other sorts of energy from the far eastern region of russia so but here you look china and russia also do trade and it is 200 billion dollars but it is a balanced trade 50 50 percentage so so china so india is telling uh, india russia relationship also should become like that but russia is telling uh, we'll just not buy traditional raw particles agricultural products we'll buy machinery itself like that uh, russia is telling but what the uh, foreign minister is telling is telling the real concern is payments because uh, dollar sanction is there right and logistics and certifications so but right now how the trade is going they it is going through rupee ruble trade only through vastra accounts vastra accounts are foreign accounts that uh, countries or companies have in other banks so why they are doing a rupee ruble trade that is to bypass western sanctions so and one more important thing that happened at this meeting is uh, eurasian economic commission so russia through the eurasian economic commission is looking for free trade agreement with uh, india so this is actually a good thing uh, uh, india is under western pressure because of late what uh, india did is india bought huge quantity of uh, russian hydrocarbon for its energy use so the western countries did not like this so all these uh, things were uh, going on between india and russia i hope you understand understood this so now let us go on to previous year question discussion so with uh, reference to cultural history of medieval india consider the following statement siddhas of tamil region were monotheistic monotheistic and condemned idolatry so what is monotheistic that is they believed and followed only one god and condemned idolatry yes it is true lingayats of kannada region questioned the theory of rebirth and rejected caste hierarchy yes this is also true so which is correct the answer is c both one and two Uh, so you should match this kurds kurds are not from bangladesh they are found in turkey iran iraq so on and so forth so one is wrong madesis are from nepal only and rohingyas were persecuted in mehar so answer is c 2 and 3 so where can you find the great indian horn bill in its natural habitat it is western ghats in western ghats you can see uh, great indian hornbill in its natural habitat so mission indradhanush so mission intensif mission indradhanush intensified the mission indradhanush they are all related to humanization of uh, children and pregnant women so that's all for the day uh, i hope you liked it you can uh, subscribe and share it among your friends you can also comment if you have any doubt uh, you can follow us on youtube instagram uh telegram and facebook thanks for tuning in i'll meet you tomorrow bye thank you